our next speaker, Brian Johnson, should change his name to Justin. Justin, for just in time. Yes, thank you. All right, let's plug this in. It's not coming up with an option for the screen. Yeah, I am. Okay, yeah, apologies. I spilled water on my laptop yesterday, and so I'm using, like, a different laptop than I normally use. Eugen's going to grab his. He has the presentation on it from last time. Thank you so much. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Uh, my name is Brian, and I'll be talking today about conversational video interfaces, and in particular, the challenges of making it fast enough that it feels like a natural conversation. And so this gets to the question of why is real-time conversation hard? One of the reasons is that humans actually talk really fast in conversations. The delay from one person to the next is very short, and I'll get into that a little bit more. First, my name is Brian Johnson. I'm a father, a husband, and an engineer uh, for over two decades. And currently, I'm staff engineer at Tavis, where we do conversational video interfaces, among other things. So first of all, um, we decided to solve this problem by building our own fully end-to-end -end stack to do conversational video. And the reason we did that is because we wanted to be able to deliver the best experience possible. And in order to do that, it needed to be really fast. And so by, being, by bringing everything into our own stack, we're able to control as much as possible and make it really fast. We also wanted to be really flexible, so we made it so that we can allow people to replace specific parts of the stack. And I'll talk a little bit more about what the stack looks like. But overall, we deliver a video, audio, end-to-end -end solution where you can talk to a digital replica, and it uses an LLM, TTS, uh, and all of those goodies under the hood. Okay. And this is a little bit more about that. And so we've got what I'd say right now is the world's fastest audio video to audio video interface. It's under one second and we've seen it as low as 600 milliseconds in, in real world measurements. It's uh, hyper realistic and plug and play. And so this is the reason why I'm giving this talk and that is that uh, it has to be really fast. So in human in normal conversations and a lot of research has shown this, the time different, the time between when one person in a conversation stops talking and the other person starts talking can be incredibly fast, as fast as 200 milliseconds in a very good conversation. So in, in the cases where we're having a great conversation, you and me, if you actually measured the time between when I stop talking and when you start talking, it's going to be 200 milliseconds, which sounds really fast, but you'll if you pay attention to it, it's actually quite normal. There's been a lot of research that shows this. In fact, a lot of times people actually interrupt each other, and so the modal is actually 200 milliseconds, but... Uh, sometimes it's around, it's, it's up to like a, a second and sometimes as, uh, as early as one second before the other person's done talking. Okay. And in addition, it also takes us about 700 milliseconds to think of what to say. So if you put all this together, this is a really hard problem to solve, to be able to respond so quickly. So how do we do it? Well, first of all, there's all these pieces to a conversational video interface. First, it's visual. You can actually see somebody audio, it actually sounds like someone, it can see you and hear you. At the same time, it can, it has some knowledge. So like LLMs, think LLMs, it's logical. It's, it's kind of holding a temporal sort of sequence of events. And it's also interactive or interruptible is how we like to think about that. So we have this uh, thing we call it Carter. You can go right now to Tavis.io. You can try our demo on the site and live. You can just sit there and actually talk to the replica one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. We got number one product of the day on Product Hunt, which was kind of cool the day we launched. And I have a little demo and this cool experience. What do people tend to... I'm actually not going to do the demo right now, though, because I don't think I have time. Oops. Where did the thing go? Sorry, Eugene. Okay. So the one of the other big difficulties when you're talking about speed is that video is way bigger than audio. And you've seen a lot of demos probably about voice to voice. That's pretty hard to do. Uh, have a really quick response time of 200 milliseconds. I haven't seen very many that have done that. But then if you throw video into the mix as well, which is 10,000 times the size of audio, it gets really difficult. And so what are some of the tools we use? I'm just gonna quickly go over these. Uh, this is the list of tools that we use to apply to our conversational video pipeline to make it faster. A lot of this should probably be pretty obvious if you're 
pretty deep into engineering. If not, I'll go, I'll go through these really quickly. And the first one here is streaming. Streaming is the idea of sending as few bytes or as few frames of data as you possibly can to get something visible to the user, to get some first interaction or some first visual. We apply streaming throughout the entire pipeline at every stage, from streaming in audio, video from the user, to streaming it to a, an LLM, into an LLM, or streaming it out of the LLM, because you can't really stream into an LLM, uh, streaming into a TTS and out of the TTS, and also streaming back to the user. So not streaming is kind of slow, quick little demo there, and streaming is much faster. Okay, let's see if I can get through these really quick so I don't have to spend time on these. Sorry about that. It's n times faster. So the 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 less you can send, uh, the the large the smaller the chunks you can send, the faster it is to that first interaction. The other thing we applied is parallelism. So there's all these six steps or whatever going on, like multiple things going on at the same time. If we can not have to do those in sequence, but do them kind of at the same time, it's going to be faster. Super obvious. Here's a kind of a diagram of all the different steps that are going on inside the pipeline. And you've got things like speech detection, audio buffering, text uh, speech to text, chatbot or LLM. Then you have sentence endpointing, text to speech, uh, replica inference, and then streaming on both sides. And then there's a little visual question answering. So parallelism is super important. And here's what it looks like if you don't do parallelism and what it looks like if you do do parallelism. So you're doing multiple things at the same time simultaneously, but they're still going in sequence. So that has n times throughput. Now throughput is not latency. So throughput won't get you all the way to having under a second utterance utterance, but throughput will allow you to not run into a barrier of what, how much you can send. So you're not gonna end up buffering that first frame because you have a high throughput, you're able to send through that first, second, third frame without running into your limits of what you can send. So through the higher the throughput doesn't necessarily get you faster latency, but there's a throughput where if you're below that throughput, it will increase your latency because you can't send it up data to render a single frame of video. The next thing is kind of like multitask. I'm gonna skip through that because I think parallelism covers it. And then the final thing is, is a, it, the final kind of category is putting things into memory. One aspect of that is in CPU memory. Another aspect is into GPU memory. So without uh, putting things into memory, you're kind of transferring things one at a time. And you, you get this video frame, you transfer it over. You get another video frame, you transfer it over. This is from the inference side uh, of this. But if you keep all those video frames, the source video frames in memory and the source data in memory, you can basically pass around a pointer to whatever you need to reference at a given time. This may not make a lot of sense if you're not familiar with our pipeline, but just know that that originally one of our challenges was having to load things from the disk or or keep things in CPU memory or, 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 or well, those were the only two other really options. And we ended up putting things into GPU memory as much as possible to speed them up. And that got us from like 1.5 seconds of, it, it trimmed off about 1.5 seconds of, of latency from our response times. GPU memory, same story. The idea is that the further away your data lives, the further away it the further it has to travel, and that traveling takes time. So if we can move all that data into the GPU, we're faster. And we saw like a 4x speed up from this, from going from 15 frames per second to 90 frames per second. Now our data renders at a natural 25 frames per second, which means every 40 milliseconds we have to deliver a frame to the user. And so we need to be rendering faster than that by quite a significant amount in order to keep up with it and to keep, keep up and keep a smooth video output. All right, so what's next? We have, uh, we've, we've uh, brought on board quite a few customers and the things that we've heard about have actually changed since this presentation. Our boot times are now around two, two seconds, um, modal two seconds from when you make an API re request to when the video conference room is available and the replica is there ready to listen. Our utterance to utterance times are anywhere from 600 milliseconds to about 1.3 seconds, and it's interruptible. We have events and observability going out so you can actually know when the replica is talking, when the person's talking. You can get information about what's happening in the conversation when people join and leave. And then we also have an API where you can do this all through like a REST API. It's pretty easy and pretty quick and you can check it all out. 
at tavis.io. Uh, the big lessons on speed are to separate things thoughtfully. I think initially we separate every single thing into a different process, but that introduces a ton of overhead and complexity and then ends up with extra latency because you're not coordinating things as fast as possible. And then the, the second part is to try to keep reusable data in memory. Don't let it fall out of memory, keep it in memory, reuse it as much as possible, and then break things into smaller chunks when possible. And that's that. Um, and so the idea is that by making it really fast, it feels more realistic. And you, if you go give it a shot, you might, you might experience this. By when you're talking to a replica that responds really quickly, it feels a lot more like you're talking to a real person. Not that that's what we're trying to do, but it feels more natural, more ergonomic. Uh, when you have to wait, you start questioning things. Even if it's like two seconds or one and a half seconds, you start to think, is this thing going to respond? Is it going to come back? Like, what is it going to, is it broken? And so being fast really makes a big difference because that's what we're used to. Uh, some use cases are things like Nike.com. What if you could go to a website and on the website, Michael Jordan appeared before your Nikes and was guiding you through the process. We also uh, recently introduced function calling into our LLM layer. So now you can do things like change the web page or order the shoes that, that, the, that the person is asking about. Uh, that's all up to users of our API to do, but we make it possible through function calling. Here's some other use cases, sales rep, customer tech support, and tutoring. Uh, our customers really love us. We're very developer focused. So if you're a developer and you wanna build out an application with this kind of AI, please reach out. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to help you have a really great experience building the interface so that you can focus on the user problem and building out the business domain. And that's it. That's my talk. You can check us out at this URL. Thank you. Thank you. And I can, are we taking questions, Eugene? Okay. All right. Any questions? Any questions? Don't everybody raise your hands at once. I literally said not to do that. Nice talk, first of all. And you mentioned parallelism and task, and both are the same, or, or not? Because I was are. a little bit confused, uh, as you mentioned both. So I know that parallelism is parallelism and you have different tasks that you are doing it in parallel, but why you put these two together uh, to differentiate both? Yeah, so that's a really great question. The question was, aren't tasks and parallelism the same? And the answer is yes, they are. And in fact, I don't know if you heard me at the beginning, but I spilled water on my laptop, so I lost my updated presentation. This is the old one. Uh, but yes, that's a very good point. And I kind of looked at that uh, when I was re-editing it and was like, yeah, these are the same. So I don't think there's really a lot of, a lot of difference there. And I'll, I'll be a little transparent. Some of this was me editing this presentation down because originally when I, when I made this, it was, it exposed a lot of internal details that I, I, I kind of wasn't sure I should really be getting into because those things change. And so when I renamed it to tasks that kind of ruined that and, and, and combined those two deeper details together. So just to, it's totally a, a good a good feedback. Yeah, go ahead. How big should be a chunk, by the way? So we're down to anywhere from three to six frames of video as a chunk. So that's kind of how we break it up by frames. And so we've got a frame of audio that goes with a frame of video. And we're trying to get as close to one frame as possible. So if you think about it, our natural video play rate is 25 frames per second. So it's 40 milliseconds per frame. There's also some like latency and render time that goes with each one of those. So if you multiply 40 times just four, you've got 160 milliseconds. And then you've got to also render it. So you got to play that out because you need to play through it. Then you need to also render it. That might take 100 milliseconds. So you're talking 260 milliseconds right there. You can't get to that 200 millisecond modal if you have four frames with our model. So we want to get to one. Cool. Uh, uh, Megabytes? Uh, other questions? Yeah. All right, thanks. Thanks for the talk. Um, I was really interested in the, I guess, the replication because I think there was like the, you were talking a lot about the audio and the understanding and interoperability, but there's also the video side of things. And uh, how do you like, you have to merge them, right? You can't have the video be first or video be last and then the mm -hmm. audio be. So you could talk more about, about that process of like merging audio and video. Yeah, so our model takes in audio and spits out video. So it takes in like a window of audio and then it basically figures out a frame of video from that window. 
and then we have to base we have to get um, the amount of audio we need for that video frame and then at the back end we have to sync back up the audio and video together and send that down the rest of the pipeline together and then send them out at exactly the same time and this is a very interesting detail is that when you're doing streaming webrtc is one of the technologies available to you and, and it's all about timing it's all about sending the video frame and the audio frame at exactly the same time um we have a partner, their name is daily.co that we we're using and they're really helping us to figure, they helped us to figure that out. They're a great partner and a great service. I de definitely recommend you check them out. So um, I guess over the course of a conversation, your customers are probably going to have uh, context that's like relevant context that's changing quite a lot, right? Yeah. And that's going to be coming from their own systems, um, you know, via RAG or something. How do you handle that at the moment or like, do you handle that? So we have an LLM layer that you can customize. You can, it, it's open API or open AI spec. So it matches open AI spec. If you have your own LLM, even if you don't, and you just want to intercept that layer and then put an LLM with RAG behind it, you can do that with our setup. We do have our own LLMs. We have four different LLMs we offer. We have one that's incredibly fast right now um, that we offer. It's using Llama 3.1. Uh, and we're doing uh, 8B, and we'll, we will do 70B soon. Uh, but you can also pick, bring in your own LLM. In fact, some of our, most of our early customers do that because they came to us with an LLM that was already pre-trained, pre-ready to go. And so they just plug their LLM into our conversational video interface, and they uh, get like a an audio visual layer on top of that LLM. Does that often affect latency, though? That actually introduces a bit of extra latency. So depending, it really depends on how fast the LLM is, but even with the LLM we ended up using, it's over uh, a, a WebSocket connection or an HTTP connection. So that's, you can, you can have it be incredibly fast if your LLM is set up that way because text is actually super small in terms of the size. You can, if you're co-located in terms of your data center, you can get down to like 30 milliseconds of latency for, uh, for that first uh, byte to be delivered. And then it's a matter of how fast you can spit out tokens. But yeah, you can see really fast times even with a with the with a custom or LLM. But then it becomes uh, your job to to tune that up, and we can help you with that because we've done it already. Cool. Thanks. Hey, thanks. Have you ever thought about like predicting and caching potential things that'll come up in a conversation? Because um, I know yeah, every 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 meeting probably has like at least seventy five phrases that are like commonly repeated. Uh, like, hey, let's circle up after this. Like, yeah. you could probably have tons of these things like running in the background with an LLM that's just like, based on this conversation, come up with a few things that might be said and then cache responses. So the question is, could we just pre-render the responses to some degree and just use that? And we we definitely, and, and the question was, well, did we think about that? Or have we tried that? We haven't tried it. We do have one canned response actually, which is the initial intro, which is programmable. So you can always have like the same intro if you want, but like everything after that is rendered on the fly. And it was mostly out of, out of initial, uh, effort to, to reduce complexity, <laughs> like to minimize the amount of complexity. So we just wanted it to be really fast and do the, do it kind of the same way every time initially, uh, that may be like an optimization we do in the future. If there is like an external LLM, that's a little slower. For instance, we might offer someone the ability to kind of, send out uh, sort of like an indication of initial, an initial phrase, like yeah or nah. The challenge is that you still have to interpret what someone's saying and that is, and that is uh, and, and in order to like say the right thing or the appropriate thing. If somebody says, oh, I just wrecked my car, you don't wanna go, yay, you know? And so uh, the fact is the later parts of our pipeline, the TTS and the uh, visual rendering are really quite fast. We're rendering at like over a hundred frames per second on the video and the audio latency is like 70 milliseconds for our, on our TCS. So that part's not really the hard part. I think the harder part is actually figuring out when the person is done talking, streaming out the LLM, figuring out when sentences are done. And then, um, and then those are actually really the hardest parts. Those two parts. Yeah. Cool. Last question. Thank you. Okay. First of all, great talk. Um, uh... Two questions actually, like uh, the first one being that, uh, have you ever experimented with multimodal models instead of stitching together the models like LLMs, then text-to-speech, or maybe speech-to-text also in the beginning? Yeah. What's the output like in comparison? Yeah, so 
uh, the question is, have we experimented with multimodal models? That's a great question. We do actually, our video model is actually multimodal. It takes in audio and spits out video. So that's about as far as we've gone so far. We are currently researching deeper multimodal and eventually our plan is to have the whole pipeline be capable of being multimodal. So voice audio in, voice audio out and in, in one in one model altogether. But we're not there yet. Cool. Yeah, that's that's kind of one of the goals. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I was gonna say 